Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 24th, and my guest is Garrett Jones of George Mason University. Garrett is currently guest blogging at EconLog. Garrett, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's great to be back. Our topic today is debt. In a recent post at EconLog, you referenced a rather remarkable paper written in 1933 by Irving Fisher. The title of that paper is The Debt Deflation Theory of Great Depressions. It was published in Econometrica, a very respected economics journal. Uh, in that paper, Fisher speculated that large contractions in the economy, Great Depressions, of which he was in the middle of one in 1933 when it was published and certainly in the middle of one when he wrote the paper a little before, he argued that those contractions in the economy were caused by the interaction of debt and deflation. Explain his argument. Well, um, Fisher took for granted the idea that in a normal economy, if the money supply falls, prices will fall, wages will fall. Um, he knew that a lot of his fellow economists took this idea as the standard. This was known as the, the classical theory of the macroeconomy. Uh, wages and prices will adjust to a fall in the money supply. So to people who believed in that, uh, big, Great Depressions were a huge puzzle. Uh, if the banking system collapses and it seems as though people can't get their hands on money, why don't wages and prices just fall and to the point that all the products get sold and all the workers are cheap enough to hire? And Fisher thought he had an explanation for this. He took the classical ideas at face value. He said, okay, I'm going to agree with you classicals, of which Fisher was an important one himself, right? I'm going to agree with you classicals that wages and prices are quite flexible and that they adjust when money supply falls. But look, there's one really important contract that doesn't automatically adjust when the, when the money supply falls, and that's debt contracts. So if uh, you've signed a mortgage that says you owe $100,000 over the, and you have to repay it over 30 years, uh, your bank doesn't come to you and say, oh, hey, we know things got worse, so now you only owe us $80,000. Um, the same with big corporations who come out and borrow money. Um, if they borrow $10, $10 million um, and the price level falls, uh, in the whole economy, they still owe the same $10 million. And it's much harder to get their hands on that money. And Fisher followed that thought through to its natural consequences. And what he thought would happen was that homeowners, uh, households, and businesses would all be in a scramble to get their hands on cash. And they would try to sell whatever assets they could. And they would create fire sales. There would be a lot of bad macroeconomic consequences from trying to trying to raise up the cash so quickly to be able to repay debts that were made back when price levels were higher. So this is, if we go to the standard language of Keynesian and modern economics, what's often described as a stickiness. So he was mm -hmm. disputing, or not disputing, he wasn't discussing the possibility, as many modern economists argue, that wages and prices are sticky, That mean, meaning slow to adjust to changes in either the money supply situations, the overall price level, whatever it is, um, changes in supply and demand. All those in, in, uh, in microeconomics, you say, well, prices and wages adjust to, to quote, clear the market so mm -hmm. that there aren't large gluts and large uh, shortages. And so what, what, to try to get a handle on what Fisher was arguing, he was arguing that, well, those things are, they still, those prices and wages still move around, right? So he, he, he was willing to concede the point that wages and prices were pretty flexible. And he said, even if I believe you classicals on that issue, there's an incredibly important contract, an incredibly important price that is still rigid. And it's rigid by law. It's rigid by, by contract. And these are these, these debts that all of us have contracted. Some of us owe money. Some of us are owed. And as uh, Fisher and others since then have put it, the, uh, the, the way that one can solve a... The way one can fix an economy when there's a debt deflation is through universal bankruptcy. You know, we all admit, okay, we can't repay this. Let's all go to, let's all go to the bankruptcy court and admit that you know, maybe it's not really our fault because we didn't expect the price level to fall. 
Um, but let's all contract re- new debts. Let's all, you know, take a zero off of the debts we owe, for, ha- for instance. And let's go back to trying to repay things um, with new lower debt levels. Well, there's a big difference between, when you say universal bankruptcy, do you mean repudiation of existing debt or the writing down of debt? One, it, it could be either way. I mean, um, I, I tend to think of it as writing down of debt. I mean, that's often what happens in real world bankruptcies. So corporate bankruptcies, individual bankruptcies often involve a writing down of debt or a rescheduling of a, of a lot of old debts. So if I owe you, let's, let's walk through an example of this and then I want to turn to a little more detail of how this, why this is such, so problematic. So let's take one of your examples. Let's say uh, that you gave. So I, I borrow, uh, $100,000 to buy a house. Mm-hmm. I owe the bank $100,000. Uh, and I borrow that money based on my income level at the, today. Uh, the bank expecting me to be able to, they understand there's a risk I might lose my job. Sure. But they, uh, if that doesn't happen, they expect me, they will only lend me the money if I'm able to, to carry the, the debt and the principal and the interest that, that, to repay it. Now, all of a sudden, let's say there's fierce deflation. Fierce. So all wages and prices fall by 50%. Mm-hmm. So my salary, which used to be whatever it was, is now half of what it was. Mm-hmm. And that $100,000 debt, it, to meet the debt payments on it, the monthly payments, is now very, very difficult. Yeah. A person would normally have to earn twice as much uh, to pull that off in real terms. So and, your debt just grew Twice as much in real terms. In real terms. Yeah. And, and my ability to repay it, the, the cash I have on hand for my income is not mm-hmm. going to be adequate. I'm suddenly – we're not talking about issues like being underwater, which, which is a whole separate mm-hmm. – uh, not unrelated. But, but right now, I'm, I'm physically challenged to pay off my debt. So yes. I either have to get a second job. I either have to um, sell some things to mm-hmm. finance the – sell my car, which let's say I own outright to, so I can cover – I don't want to go – bankrupt. Now, you're suggesting that one way to solve – so first, why is that a problem? Explain to me why that – so I'm in trouble. Uh, I'm going to – I lose my house uh, as a result probably in that story. Um, why is that so bad? I mean, it's bad. It's sad. But w- what's the problem? Well, you know, in the simplest world, um, if this person just decided they were going to keep their promises no matter what, then it's a huge windfall for the bank and the owners of the bank who now have a lot more buying power. And it's a huge loss for the person who borrowed the money. So it would just be a transfer if everybody kept their promises here. Right. But, um, and, you know, economists, we try not to moralize too much about transfers, although uh, there's... Yeah. Uh, but we can't help ourselves. We can't help ourselves. Some, sometimes. But uh, what Fisher pointed out is that what will happen when people try to uh, keep their old promises is that there will be a lot of changes in the economy. Nowadays, we'd emphasize, we'd think of these as, at the very least, supply-side changes, Right. So the neighborhoods where bankers live will have a lot more buying power. The neighborhoods where bank borrowers live will have a lot less buying power. So we would expect shops to move from one side of town to the other side of town. That's a supply side change. Can't happen overnight, though. Can't happen so overnight. That transition might be challenging for. Yes. And if it's not across town, it might be across regions. It might be. Mm-hmm. So there could be. So that by itself is a real supply side shock that that has to happen. It's just a transition. Might take a while. Um, but Fisher was more concerned about the fire cells that would happen. And he was concerned about this partly for, again, supply side reasons. Um, he thought that if, uh, if people were selling their assets, if corporations were selling off portions of their company, subdivisions to, uh, on the open market, um, in what we call a fire sale as fast as possible at the lowest price, uh, he was afraid that these assets would wind up in the wrong hands. Not the, and not in any moral sense, but just in less productive hands. When you're in a rush to sell, uh, a product is probably going to wind up in the hands of the person who can't do the best job with it. But it's also true the price of those assets is going to be lower than it might have been a few periods before. Is that problematic? Um, that's usually what people worry about in a fire sale s- situation, that, that, that there's going to be this cascade that as everyone tries to sell the assets, we're going to get very little for it, and it's not going to necessarily fix the problem even. You're right. That's, that's an issue that Fisher was concerned with as well. Because everybody's trying to do it at the same time, um, that means that they aren't as it's – it's much harder to solve the problem. Um, and we found some evidence for that in the most recent financial crisis. You know, there were some kinds of insurance companies that held – that were in a big rush to sell their mortgage-backed securities because of accounting requirements and others that weren't. There was a recent NBER paper that looked at this. And 
the insurance companies that were in a huge hurry to sell their mortgage-backed securities uh, for for um, accounting reasons sold them at much lower prices, even when you looked at the underlying quality of the asset. So the fire sale was was for real, and these companies didn't raise as much as if they'd been able to have you know a couple of weeks, a couple of months to sell these to sell these uh, securities. But as you point out, the, the the other issue, of course, is that not everybody's going to either be able to or want to honor their promises. So. Mm-hmm. Let's say, and now we come into this issue of being underwater, uh, defaulting on debt, uh, vo- quote, voluntarily and after a bad change of circumstances. Uh, or when I say voluntarily, I mean choosing not to honor your promises because mm-hmm. you it's extremely difficult or very costly. Or it's not in your own self-interest, so you have to weigh the, any moral issues versus the self-interest issues. So the issue here would be I, I, I owe 100000 to the bank. Even if I sell everything I have and take a second job, I'm in trouble. The mm-hmm. bank's not going to get the flow of interest it anticipated. So isn't there an additional issue that the bank itself has made promises to folks that it's not going to be able to keep? Yes. Uh, we're all tied together. Um, interconnectedness is a big part of modern capitalism, right, on the financial side and on the real side. And uh, so one bank uh, gets into trouble, and then the people that they owe money to uh, find it tougher. The bank itself might have a tougher time making loans to people. Uh, this is something that's been tested a fair amount uh, over the last few financial crises around the world. And when multinational banks have problems in in their home country, they start having problems, and they're less they're less excited about lending um, in their branches that are overseas. So, isn't the solution for this just you, you talked about universal bankruptcy? When we're talking about the stickiness of these promises, they're made in nominal terms. So, mm-hmm. one can imagine two ways to fix this. One would be to have contracts written with adjustments for price indices, inflation, deflation, et cetera. So the mm-hmm. amount I have to pay back might adjust with inflation or deflation. But the second is a little more straightforward. And it's called you write the debt down. Mm-hmm. You're, you're what we started talking about a minute ago. So I can't pay 100000 I go to the bank and say, look, when, when I made the loan, when you made the loan to me, I had a salary of such and such. I can't earn that anymore because of deflation. I also might be unemployed. But let's just say I have a job still. I just My salary's gone down. Uh, and that presumes that wages are flexible. Mm-hmm. And I go to the bank and say, look, I need you to take less. And you should be happy with that because you're going to get, in real terms, what, you, what, you, what I promised I'd pay you before. Now, over the last few years in the financial crisis, a, a fair number of banks have done this. These are known as short sales where the bank just looks around at the real world and says, uh, yeah, it looks like um, you paying us you know, whatever you can on the house. You selling the house and giving us – 15% less than you originally owed, we'll take that. And this won't be a big hit to your credit rating. It took banks a little while to, to come around to that point of view. But these things known as short sales are, uh, a, are much more common than I think a lot of us would have expected a few years ago. So banks are, in a sense, doing allowing a voluntary bankruptcy. They're allowing voluntary write-downs of a lot of mortgage debt over the last couple of years. Of course, that's very time-consuming. I mean, you have a lot of them all at once. It's one thing when one person has bad luck, bad set of circumstances – Obviously, if everybody you've lent money to wants to do that, you've got a major issue of negotiation, transaction costs, et cetera. Although you could just write them off. You could just say everybody gets 10% or 20% or 40% cut. Yes, and, and presumably, I'm no, I'm no expert on this, but I'm guessing that banks would have neighborhood-by-neighborhood neighborhood rules of thumb that they use. Um, so this neighborhood, we know what's happened, and we'll, we'll easily take a 10% write down. This other neighborhood over here, not so much. So then the puzzle is why... It's an interesting observation, and it's fact, mm-hmm. that, that the unexpected deflation, and I emphasize unexpected, mm-hmm. unexpected deflation is uh, tough on um, people who've made contracts in nominal terms. Uh, the lender might not get the money back. If the lender does, it's a windfall. Mm-hmm. Uh, the borrower might not be able to repay. If the borrower keeps the promise that was made, it's a loss, a transfer, as you said earlier. W- why does that cause a, a depression? What's Fisher's argument for why this this chain of events? So there's fire sales. So what? It just it just a, you know it's part of the noise and chaos of a of an economy that things change and shift and uh, sometimes your wages go up, sometimes they go down, sometimes your debt gets more expensive, sometimes it gets cheaper. What? Why is it cause a Great Depression? Um, his story was that the the mass bankruptcy would have a lot of supply side disruptions that could last for quite a long time, um, and. With in that kind of a world, um, 
people are reluctant to trust each other. This is something that I'd say is much clearer in later research. Ben Bernanke's work on uh, net worth and business fluctuations is, I think, uh, probably the best follow-on to Irving Fisher's idea, which is that um, when people are underwater in their homes, when companies are essentially underwater in their, uh, on their own balance sheet, uh, when their debts are high compared to the present value of their future cash flows, um, these companies can't go out there and borrow readily. These companies can't put skin in the game when they have a new promising project. Um, entrepreneur people in over the last few years find it much harder and much more expensive to get a home equity line of credit for their homes. And, you know, entrepreneurs start new businesses with home equity lines of credit, right? Those of us who want to start businesses, um, who have promising ideas for new businesses, um, if you've got home equity, you can be borrowing at four or 5% right now for that to start that new business. Uh, a person who doesn't have home equity is going to be borrowing on their credit cards, 18, 20, 25%. And so that adds a real barrier to, um, to starting off new businesses. So the argument there is that we get overextended mm-hmm. for reasons we'll get to in a minute because Fisher has an explana- has a, a speculation about how we get into this over indebtedness. Not just that there's debt in the economy. He argues we get over indebted, and mm-hmm. that then limits our ability to climb out of the hole. Is what is the way I understand what you're saying? Is that mm-hmm. a good summary? Yes, that when people are when people are underwater in their homes, and when companies are essentially underwater in their own firms. It makes it a lot, a lot harder to uh, climb out. We This is often called the debt overhang hypothesis. So Japan, some people think, has been suffering from debt overhang for well, well over a decade, going on uh, two decades now. And so underwater, just to clarify, underwater means? It's when you owe more than your asset is worth. Yeah. So if I have a, a $100,000 mortgage and Zillow tells me my home is worth $75,000, I'm underwater in my home. No bank will give me a home equity line of credit because I have no home equity. Right, well, and you have negative equity. Right? Have negative so, equity, yeah. And so to continue making that payment is not so attractive. You might do it again out of obligation or for worries about your, your you know, moral reasons or worries about your future ability to get credit, but it's um, it's a very bad deal. It's a very bad deal from the bank's point of view. It's a very no, from the from the bar, from the lender, from the borrower's point of view, right? You're you're in, You're repaying an amount that isn't, very attractive relative to the assets value. You're buying something that, it's, that at a price that's much higher than it's worth. Yes, this is something that a lot of families in places like Arizona and Florida have worried about over the last couple of years. Yeah. Why am I paying mortgage a mortgage on a home that I'm never going to own? Yeah. Uh, or that if I own, I've, I've overpaid for it. I'll yeah. have paid a, a large amount. Why not just hit the reset button and move to a new neighborhood? Yeah, and the answer would be, it's bad for your credit. You might not feel good about it morally, et cetera. Um, now, let's put this a little bit for a minute. I want to, we're going to come back and talk a little bit about more about the Fisher's theory, but I want to put it in um, historical context. So he's writing this in 1933. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I find striking about it is that I often hear that Keynes was the first economist to address the business cycle. Now, we've talked in this program before that he wasn't. You know, economists had been, they kind of were aware that Economies went through slumps. Mm-hmm. Um, Mises obviously had written a book on it in 1920. There were others, but here's Irving Fisher, and this article was a attempt to summarize a book he had written mm-hmm. called "Booms and Depressions." Booms and Depressions. And one of the things I found charming about the article, and I recommend it. We'll, we'll put a link up to it. I hope. I hope we can do it. I've seen a link to it. I hope it's uh, property right legal. But if not, you can Google it and find it. I suspect, um, and it's certainly on JSTOR. What's charming about it, among other th- many things that are charming about the article, one of the things that's charming about it is he worries that he may have missed some past literature on this topic that he just wasn't aware of. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't claim it's novel or unique, or but he says, you know, when I wrote the book, I thought maybe it was – but I must have been anticipated by other people. He, he's assured by other scholars and future-looking that he can't find anything, right? Now, he, he has a humility, humility about his writing here, yeah. <laughs> which, uh, of course, is – it's well-suited to him um, – Especially because he's so well known in economic circles for being the person who, in 1929, said that the stock market had reached a permanently high plateau. Yes. Um, and he wasn't just talking cheap like a lot of us economists do, just speculating on things that uh, we have no financial interest in. He actually had his entire net worth tied up in the stock market. So um, he, as some people know, was he invented the precursor of the Rolodex, became a very wealthy man from that. 
and invested this all in the stock market and lost it all and became uh, not quite penniless, but Yale University allowed him to live in a home and never charged him rent for it for the rest of his life. Do you know when he died, roughly? I actually do not know. We'll look but that up. I, I, I recommend looking up uh, the Wikipedia article on him, if only because his photograph is so stately. <laughs> so would that all economists today, would that, would that I myself could pull off that kind of appearance in public? Uh, so I want to turn to the cure for this um, uh, debt and deflation crisis, which, uh, again, is rather striking in historical context. I'm going to read uh, a paragraph or so from the paper where he makes the following claim, and then I'd like you to react to it, Garrett. Here, here's the quote. Uh, he's going to talk about reflation, meaning what we would call inflation or returning the price level back to its original pre-deflation level. He says, if reflation can now so easily and quickly reverse the deadly downswing of deflation after nearly four years when it was gathering increased momentum, it would have been still easier and at any time to have stopped it earlier. In fact, under President Hoover, recovery was apparently well started by the Federal Reserve open market purchases, which revived prices and businesses from May to September 1932. The efforts were not kept up, and recovery was stopped by various circumstances, including the political campaign of fear. It would have been still easier to prevent the Depression almost altogether. In fact, in my opinion, this would have been done had Governor Strong of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York lived, or had his policies been embraced by other banks and the Federal Reserve Board and pursued consistently after his death. In that case, there would have been nothing worse than the first crash— we would have had the debt disease, but not the dollar disease, the bad cold, but not the pneumonia. If the debt deflation theory of Great Depressions is essentially correct, the question of controlling the price level assumes a new importance. And those in the driver's seats, the Federal Reserve Board and the Secretary of the Treasury, or let us hope, a special stabilization commission, will in future be held to a new accountability. Close quote. So that's a rather remarkable passage uh, in light of both, I would say, Friedman and Schwartz's Monetary History of the United States, which makes a very similar claim mm -hmm. in, I think, 1961, and our modern era. So uh, comment on react to that. Sure. Um, his, his statement about the campaign of fear is really interesting because it's reasonably contemporaneous, you know, um, and he seems to be implying that uh, something about the presidential campaign, presumably the, uh, the Democratic campaign for the presidency, Created, a, created an environment of fear that made people afraid of investing, made people, made banks afraid to lend money, and, and so held back the money supply. Uh, that just, he doesn't elaborate, but yeah. that seems like the proper reading. Um, I would like to note that I, be, I believe, I don't have a copy in front of me, but I believe you'll, one will find in, that um, Friedman and Schwartz actually refer to this piece in Econometrica in one of the footnotes. So they, were, they knew that Fisher knew about this. So the idea that Benjamin Strong had the right idea, and that the death of Benjamin Strong, um, who was head of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, um, was a key reason why the Great Depression occurred. Uh, Strong was a, was a big fan of what we would now call leaning against the wind. Um, Explain. Leaning against the wind is the idea that the, it's, the, it's a, another, way this, another uh, way this is explained is it's the Federal Reserve's party to take away the, it's the Federal Reserve's job to take away the punch bowl just as the far party is getting fun. Right? And but on the flip side, it means that when the economy is in a downturn, the Federal Reserve's job— Break out the punch. <laughs> break out the punch. But with a specific target here of the price level, not of let's maximize employment, let's um, try to control GDP, but at least keep the price level from plummeting 10, 20, 30 percent. So many contemporary observers, uh, Scott Sumner being one uh, who's been a guest on this program— have argued that that the Federal Reserve's biggest mistake in this current crisis was a failure to expand the money supply or to have – that money – monetary policy was too tight in 2007 and 2008, mm -hmm. and that precipitated the crisis. Mm -hmm. What's the evidence for that, if any, in light of the Fisher theory? Is, is Would Fisher blame Bernanke – for letting the price level, it didn't fall very much. It's not like it plummeted uh, like it did in the, in the Great Depression times. Mm -hmm. it, there was some debate over how much, whether we had some deflation or whether we just had zero inflation. Is this, does Fisher's perspective tell us anything about what's, what happened in, in this crisis? I suspect that Fisher is in the same camp as Friedman and Schwartz here. And Friedman and Schwartz in the, um, 
in their work on the Depression, they, they took it for granted that when spending by itself, when the velocity of money fell, that would be fairly hard for a central bank to, to counteract quickly. So sometimes, sometimes the private sector just gets worried and wants to hold on to their money for a while. And that's a decline in the velocity of money. Doesn't turn over as many times per time period. Mm -hmm. And so um, over time, a central bank can decide whether to react to that. But it's something that uh, uh, people in the monetarist tradition generally thought that that was a little bit on the dangerous side. Um, The government might not be smart enough or wise enough to know when to counteract a decline in the velocity of money. And a decline in the velocity of money is emphatically what we saw in the fall, fall of 2008. So when we say, why did total spending fall? Why did what we call nominal GDP fall? It was mostly because of a decline in the velocity of money. And you know, Milton Friedman, over the course of his career, wondered whether a better monetary policy could react, could counteract declines of velocity. Um, he sort of hinted at it in his famous presidential address. But at that time, he thought it was, it was beyond the scope of, of good monetary policy to react to that. Um, Sumner is in the camp of thinking that, uh, that it is within the power of good central bankers to react to changes in nominal spending. Um, I think that changes in, in, in macroeconomics have made it a little easier to talk about that than, than, than back in Friedman's day. And Friedman himself had some sympathies toward targeting total spending, um, later in life. But, but what about this argument that Fisher's making? Fisher's saying that Great Depression's He's suggesting that that large contractions of the economy, uh, 1873, 1907, uh, 1920, 1929, well, you could argue 1981, what we're in now, these larger, unusually large contractions, that they are due to a, a, a boom mm-hmm. that ends up having lots of debt. And mm-hmm. he argues in the in the paper we're talking about that – that the debt comes about because all of a sudden people sell this chance to make money and they figure out what I have to invest isn't enough and I'll borrow some. And people say, well, it's okay to lend it because it's everything's going so well. So the boom sows the seeds for the bust. Mm-hmm. When the bust comes, because people have all this debt, the there's this large co-occurring contraction in the money supply, a change in nominal values, and that debt then punishes the economy much more than it would – and if it hadn't occurred, if the debt weren't there, and the Fed can counteract that by expanding the money supply, could the Fed have done that in 2007, 2008, and avoided unemployment over 10 percent? Um, Fisher, I'm, I'm asking Garrett Jones. I'm also asking you to put on your Irving Fisher hat. It would be a wizard's hat, I think. Uh, uh, not a base. Not a, I'm not talking about a basketball team's hat. I'm talking about the kind of pointed stars and and how. You know, crescent moons on it, maybe. Always happy to wear wear his <laughs> wizard hat for Russ Roberts. <laughs> um, well, I, I think I think Fisher would have seen this as a chance to to follow an aggressive monetary policy. I think Fisher, when he saw asset an, a big asset bubble bursting, the first thing he would think is, "Wow, a whole lot of people are going to be trying to get their hands on a lot of money really quickly." We would now call that a decline in the velocity of money. Um, yeah, he'd be pretty sympathetic toward the idea of boosting the money supply. Although in good monetarist tradition, he would be aware of the long and variable lags that occur when the Fed does something. There's a lag between when the Federal Reserve increases the money supply in New York and when that percolates out to the rest of the economy. Um, so because monetarists were traditionally worried about that, they might take baby steps toward reversing big, big declines. So, um, Something a little more tepid than what some of the market monetarists of today would be in favor of. But the Fed responded quite aggressively, you could argue. Yes. Uh, and nothing happened, as far as I can tell. People will argue, can argue that the, you know there was a counterfactual. It would have been much worse. Um, others will argue, that no, 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 they, they didn't do enough. Um, monetary policy on the surface looks pretty impotent. Uh, the money is sitting in the banks. Mm-hmm. It's on their balance sheets. They're not – they have excess reserves. Mm-hmm. I blame that partly on the Fed's paying interest on reserves, which mystifies me. I don't understand that uh, because that seems to counteract what they're trying to do, accomplish. But uh, is Fisher right? I mean, is, is is Friedman right? Could can we really reflate the economy like they claimed? I don't. Does it, we have an incredibly aggressive monetary policy and no, not much reflation. That's true. We have had an uh, extremely aggressive monetary policy. Um, 
I'm certainly in the camp of those who think that if we hadn't taken some dramatic steps to keep to keep lending flowing, uh, we would have had something much worse happen. So I, it's it's not hard to get me to imagine really bad things happening after a financial crisis. We have you know the story of the Asian financial crisis, um, which uh, occurred while I was uh, earning my PhD. So that for me that was a formative experience watching what happened in East Asia, and we managed to avoid that kind of complete collapse. Um, and I think part of it, not the only reason, but part of it is because we had a, a central bank that responded really aggressively and made it, tr- made it clear to people that even if the stock market was tanking, um, they were not going to allow the money supply collapse, to collapse. You know, um, I, I do think they made mistakes in terms of, um, I think interest on reserves was a calculated risk and one that I think in, in, in retrospect we'll look back on as a mistake. Um, it did always seem, it does seem a little bit wrong to legally require banks to hold a whole bunch of assets that don't pay any interest, right? Why can't they earn the interest that they would have received on these otherwise if they had you know, been making normal private sector investments? So just as a, as a question of fairness, there's an argument for paying interest on reserves. I think it's a really bad argument because I don't know what amount you would possibly decide was fair um, since the Fed is simultaneously manipulating the, 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 the rate and then well promising taken. to pay, yeah. you know, some amount. I, I, I mean, one thing that's striking about it, you know, it, when free, when short, when excuse me, when Fisher wrote these words, the Federal Reserve was twenty years old, mm-hmm. um, not very old. No, um, and he's suggesting this golden era of discretionary monetary policy, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and and I find it fascinating. That people like Friedman, who were basically limited government, not basically, strongly in favor of limited government, uh, found themselves in a position where they were arguing in favor of, and this continues to today, government um, manipulating the money supply to try to keep the economy on track. And um, obviously, Friedman understood the dangers of the discretionary part of that, flirted with various monetary rules. Uh, John Taylor, who's a modern, uh, I would say, disciple of Friedman, I would too. invokes the Taylor rule as a way to avoid the discretionary risk. But Fisher here feels like it feels like he's he's discovered this magic potion. Going back to our wizard idea yeah. of reflation, so that we'll never have another downturn again. And some would argue, well, we didn't for a long, long time. We had we had seventy, we had f- at least fifty years of good times after this, or forty years of good times after. Uh, this before there was a serious recession in 1981, which of course was partly the result of bad monetary policy in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, when then we had the great moderation, supposedly the result of wise monetary policy. What do you think? I'm not uh, sure what the question is. I'm just talking. Sure, Sorry. sure. Well, <laughs> let me let me point to that. If we don't just have to say that Fisher was looking back on 20 or so years of good Federal Reserve policy. He could look back at the classical gold standard which was a time of enormous long-run price stability, combined with, I want to emphasize, really high, really volatile short-run prices. Yeah. So short-run prices, short-run inflation was incredibly volatile um, during the classical gold standard for the U.S. Uh, boom times in the U.S. were times of rising prices and wages. Recessions were times of collapsing prices and wages. And that, they had a kind of flexibility that we don't see at all today. But notice what that means is that under the classical gold standard, if there was a 5 or 7 or 8% decline in overall prices and wages, everyone knew that prices were going to go back up because the gold standard pinned down the long-run price level. And that meant that uh, you, you know, if somebody looks around and says, wow, it looks like I can't afford my mortgage today because my wages are low, well, in a year or two, you're probably going to be able to because we know what happens under the classical gold standard. Wages and prices go back up. So any kind of deviation would just be a temporary issue. So those who look to the gold standard as um, a model because they think it'll uh, dampen inflation volatility are quite wrong. That's not one of the strengths of the gold standard. Um, the gold standard pins down long-run prices. It does not pin down short-run prices. But you get this other benefit you're saying. That when prices fall, you know they're going to go back up, so you don't have debt deflation. Yeah. So Fisher looked at that, and he has charts in the paper showing the long-run price stability um, under the gold standard era. And uh, that must have been one of the things he was he saw as something the Fed should be trying to replicate. 
how to get the good benefits of the gold standard era while avoiding something like the Panic of 1907, which led to the Federal Reserve's creation. At least that's the official At story. At least that's the official I'm story. I'm not so sure that's true. I think it was equally possibly a uh, political maneuvering by small banks versus large banks and – or large banks versus small banks and um, – I'm I'm sympathetic to a public choice explanation because there've been a lot of. I'm always sympathetic to a public choice explanation. There've been a lot of other crises. Why this one precipitated this Mm -hmm. big change? Uh, I don't know. Uh, It's hard to know. Um, Now you've also written. This is related, and you can uh, tell me if it's how it's related. That private debt and public debt are not so. Distinct. Mm-hmm. What does that have any significance for our conversation? It's an interesting observation. You can talk about what you mean by that. Uh, what's its relevance for for this recovery or uh, the mess? Well, uh, uh, part of what we found out during this financial crisis is that a lot of debts that were private sector on paper were public sector de facto, right? So economists knew this was true for, say, Fannie and Freddie debt. Right, that the debts they issued were officially not guaranteed by the government, but economists all suspected, most of us at least, that in any crisis the government would back that up, and sure enough, that's what happened. So did markets. I mean, if you looked at the premium that they had to pay over Treasuries, it was quite small. Just a few basis Su- points suggesting above Treasuries. Suggesting that, yes. that investors presumed they would be backed by the government, and they were right. The, and they were right. The market market prices gave the right message there, and um, but also what we found in this crisis is something fewer people expected, which was that. The debts of all the biggest banks, all of the biggest banks, were backed by the government. So every time in the mid-2000s, when Citibank was going out into the financial markets and ostensibly borrowing $10 million here, $100 million there, every time any of the big top 10 banks, certainly the top 10 banks in the country, um, were were borrowing private money, what they were really doing is they were borrowing money that was insured by the government. We just didn't know it yet. And so this is one reason for us to be a little bit cautious, I think, about um, encouraging high levels of indebtedness, high levels of private sector indebtedness. On, on the argument, well, it's private. If people take their own chances, but it doesn't look like it's their chances. It's, it's my not, chances. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's the it's the government's chances, and it's the taxpayers' chances. Yeah. So there's for for big players and for homeowners, there is the line between private and public debt is quite blurry. Why is that important other than the moral hazard? Is that the only – is that the importance of it? I think the moral hazard is important because it, it means we invest in the wrong things, right? We're, less, shows, we're less careful. We're, we're a lot less careful. And um, after after a crisis hits, it means it just changes the kind of government we have. We now have a government whose job it is to repay this enormous, enormous amount of debts of explicit and implicit liabilities. That is now what our government is for, right? So – the government, uh, the federal government in the U.S. has these, expl- these uh, explicit liabilities to repay treasury bondholders. We have implicit liabilities to repay, or fairly explicit liabilities to repay Social Security, Medicare, federal employees, um, retirement benefits, uh, veterans, health care benefits, and now um, the debts of the biggest banks. Strangest part of that, of course, is that in our earlier conversation, we talked about the potential for write downs or forgiveness or bankruptcy. Uh, when the government's holding the debt, it's a little weird, right? Their, their willingness to negotiate and is no longer just a matter of rationality or prudence; it becomes a political issue. And we see this with with you know General Motors right now. Supposedly, General Motors wants the government to sell its shares of General Motors so it can be fully private. And the government's not interested in doing that because they'd realize a $15 billion loss, which would be politically embarrassing to the Obama administration, I assume. Let's wait until mid-November before we do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, when you posted on this Fisher article, you said you found it um, much more convincing than Keynes's general theory, which was published three years later. Uh, what's the evidence for that claim? Is it just a matter of your taste? Why, why do you say that? I don't think it's just it, – it, it may partly be a matter of my taste. I, I, I'll concede that. But what Fisher does is even though it's a short paper, it is a complete equilibrium story. He tells you a story of a whole economy. The reason he can do it in just a few pages is because he basically imports the whole, cl- the whole classical structure. He says, OK, you know, labor supply, labor demand, wages, prices adjust. OK, I'm importing all of that and I'm just adding this one thing. So mentally a, a reader – who's kind of familiar with, with 
um, classical macro, wage and price flexibility, it's easy for us to, to see this as a complete model of the economy. Um, Keynes instead starts off his book saying, I'm doing something completely different, and I'm throwing out everything from the old days. And once he's done that, he's, we have to start anew. Mentally, it's, it's very hard. I think a lot, of, a lot of us have read the first you know, uh, few chapters where Keynes claims he's laying out his complete model of the economy, his complete general theory. And I, I came away with the experience thinking he didn't actually build a model here. He talked about a couple of channels, but he didn't close it out. And so Fisher, Fisher feels like an economics model. So, you know, in a sense, Hicks, we can say that Hicks and maybe to some extent Samuelson and later folks tried to close uh, Keynes' story and make it feel more like a normal model, F- make it feel more like economics where we can tell who are the people making choices, what are their incentives, how are they interacting with each other. So there's a lot fewer can openers, I think, sitting in Fisher's story. <laughs> Uh, what role do bubbles play in Fisher's story, if at, if at all? He he certainly thinks there's some kind of bubble going on during the boom, right? And the bubble leads to the debt. And to him, the debt is the problem. So some other macro theorists look at the boom and see um, supply-side imbalances occurring. You know, we're building the wrong machines during the boom. Fisher thinks— That would be the Austrian m- Yeah, I, th- I think it's most uh, uh, associated with Austrians. That we, we, during the boom, people build a lot of long-period capital projects, take on a lot of projects that turn out to not work in the bust. So that's a, a supply-side channel. Um, Fisher and um, I would guess we could say Minsky is a later, later person in that same vein, both thought that um, what happens during the boom that's a, the biggest problem is that we write the wrong contracts. People signed voluntarily the wrong contracts during the boom, and that's what has to be unwound during the bust. And it won't be sustained. They can't be sustained when the deflation comes. Once the deflation comes, those contracts start looking, start creating a lot of macroeconomic trouble. It creates a windfall for a few, but um, it creates real supply-side disruptions for the many. Just to close out this discussion about Fisher's model and, and Keynes's alternative view, uh, Keynes generated a lot of interest in this idea that the labor market doesn't clear, not because of what we were talking about earlier, which was transaction costs, reallocation costs, things can't happen quickly, but because prices for labor don't adjust, mm-hmm. that that wages are, are quote, sticky uh, or inflexible. Now, obviously, some wages are literally inflexible in the same way debt could be inflexible. I could have a long-term contract for my wage rate, mm-hmm. but it's it's a bit of a puzzle in economics why or whether even wages adjust downward. You're suggesting that in the classical gold standard period, wages were flexible downward and that, that unemployment problems were very short-term and, and disappeared fairly quickly. Is that accurate of how to capture what you're saying? Um, well, I'll say that I, I don't know the data from the classical gold standard on unemployment rates as well as, as, well as a lot of people. Um, but recessions, rapid recoveries were quite common during the gold standard period, right? So that was um, – that was – a benefit of that time. Um, and the, flexi- the fact that there was such flexibility back then would suggest to us maybe there could be that kind of flexibility again. Maybe the rigidities we see are partly built around the fact, maybe based on the fact that we've, we've created a lot of macroeconomic stability so people can, again, one could argue that the, that the welfare state, that, uh, that social insurance programs help make um, people more reluctant to take big wage cuts. But then again, prosperity itself might make people more stubborn about taking wage cuts. Pride I, I, can. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, pride is a luxury good, and people in the rich countries might be able to afford their pride. Yeah, or want to? Yeah, they want to afford it. I, 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 I've thought about it a lot. I mean, if uh, and I've used this example on the program before. If you're a, if you're a carpenter in Nevada. Excuse me, Nevada. For you Nevadans listening, if you're a Nevada carpenter. Uh, and you were making a certain amount of money, and now there's no chance of making that salary because nobody's building a house in Nevada for a long time now and won't be for a while because there's too many of them. Um, how easy would it be for you to take a 20% pay cut? Uh, and what would be the implications of that, not just for your pride, but for your next job after that? If you say, I'm just going to do this for a while, is it only a pride issue that, that you're, you've publicly – stamped on your forehead what your productivity is? Or is, it, is there some that's, signaling issue here? That's exactly right. Signaling is uh, very important as a, that, as a channel that might explain this. You take a big wage cut, and 
future employers can kind of sense it. Maybe they can tell it formally you know, or informally. They'll get a sense of what kind of person you are. And the, the, the wages you earn stamp you. So uh, my colleague Brian Kaplan uh, correctly makes a big deal about how a lot of education is signaling. Uh, that uh, you get a degree and that degree sticks with you for the rest of your life. It says, it tells somebody about your brand. And that seems to predict your wages for quite a long time. The wages of your last job have to be doing something similar. Yeah, perhaps. I, I don't know. But it's an, it's an interesting puzzle uh, to think about what current levels of unemployment are, um, their persistence, why, why they're persisting. Yeah. Now, now, I, I would like to say, though, that um, um, there's evidence that a lot, of where the, a lot of the rigidity seems to be happening inside of firms. So there's a, an excellent book by Truman Buley called Why Wages Don't Fall During a Recession. And uh, a, Yale, a Yale labor theorist who had written you know, a lot of very abstract models and then finally decided to do something that few economists do, which is actually go talk to people about how they set wages rather than just theorizing about it. And what he learned was that the word that came back again and again when he talked to top business executives, to labor union leaders, to human resource professionals, um, as to why companies didn't just cut wages when a recession hit and in order to avoid layoffs, in order to hire cheaper people, uh, was the word morale. Yeah. That word came back again and again. Morale. They were afraid that it would hurt their own firm if they if word got out that they were cutting wages or if they told everybody, oh, we're taking a 10% across the board cut. That, that would hurt productivity inside the firm. So it's a reminder that entrepreneurs, people who own businesses, often think of themselves as, to exaggerate a little bit, they're hostage to their own employees. Right? They need to keep these people happy in order to keep the, the brand value of their firm. Well, I think there's some truth to that. I think if you told your employees you're cutting your salaries 20%, uh, they'd get real mad. Uh, they wouldn't say, oh, that's great because I won't be unemployed. They're no. going to say, what are you doing? What are you talking about? And I think it comes back to your earlier point. If you've got a Federal Reserve whose goal is to avoid deflation at any price and you've never experienced deflation in your life, which most of us have never really experienced anything remotely like the 1929 period or what happened at other times uh, pre-Fed in the United States, the flexibility and prices you're talking about, then taking a pay cut is brutal. There's no comp- there's no feeling that, well, infl- don't worry, prices will come down 20% so your purchasing power won't change. Just take this 20% wage cut. Um, in many ways, the Fed's putting a floor under under the price level has destroyed the opportunity for markets to respond to these kind of situations. Yeah, this is, you know, um, you know, we economists uh, are, especially when we talk about unemployment, we, after a while, we start talking sounding like sociologists. And I mean that as a compliment to sociologists. Yeah. Right? That um, the shared experience of watching, of knowing that like a lot of people you know took wage cuts probably makes you a lot more willing to take a wage cut. Yeah. So that social knowledge that I know that you, I know that everyone else knows that this is normal to take a wage cut every couple of years. Uh, that's that's an experience that a lot of us have lost. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what do you think the central bank should do right now in the United States? If you were uh, in Ben Bernanke's chair, what would your? We're we're recording this in at the end <clears throat> at the end of September 2012, days after. Bernanke has announced that we have a new vision for the Fed. We're going to do whatever it takes and, and do it for as long as it takes until the economy is strong again. I'm thinking – I have a lot of thoughts, but one of them is what, could you have done it before? I mean, do you think everything was fine until now? But putting that to the side, a strategic question, uh, is he doing the right thing? Would you suggest something different? Um, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to this new uh, rule-based uh, quantitative easing approach, which people are calling QE3. Um, the last – to the last few waves of quantitative easing have clearly have been well defined have been clearly stated as one off events right this is a rule based system which is what do you mean rule based um what i mean is um they've said we will do we will do x in this case buying about 40 billion dollars of mortgage assets a month um and boosting the the narrow money supply by that much every month um until the labor market substantially improves and then with the with the caveat in the context of price stability Right, so this will keep going, and it's an outcome-based measure, just a little bit like the Taylor Rule. I think that's worth noting, um, and it's not a discrete. We're going to do five hundred billion. We're going to do two hundred billion. We're going to do one hundred fifty billion of this or that. Um, so, the first part, the fact that it's 
based on some partly based on a quantitative outcome means that markets have a sense of the duration. So when when shocks hit, if bad news comes along, if there's an earthquake in some important country, if there's a financial crisis in some other country, the financial markets will know, oh, I guess that means this is going to be going on a bit longer. Um, the fact that it says in the context of price stability means that all of us, all economists, all financial analysts have uh, a pass. We have a we have a, a get out of jail free card that says we can complain as much as we want to to the Fed if we start seeing market based indicators of inflation shooting up, because they promise they would not allow prices to become unstable. And you know their informal goal is some kind of two percent long term inflation goal. So um, and if those goals aren't consistent. <laughs> if those goals aren't consistent, I, my guess is they side they side with price stability. Um, I could be wrong, but I bet that it's at least well over fifty percent chance that they that they that they are willing to send the economy back into a recession if they start seeing the uh, four or five percent. Don't you think Ben Bernanke wants to be reappointed? I think he wants to be reappointed, and he does not want to go down in infamy. So I think there's a certain kind of infamy that comes from being <laughs> um, a Fed chair during the 1970s. Yeah. Um, economists love to sort of attack some of those folks now, and they're they have a certain kind of infamy. I don't think Ben Bernanke wants that infamy. I suspect that many years from now we'll learn a lot about, well, or we won't learn a lot about the political battle battles that took place inside the Fed. Uh, we've seen some academic papers, um, some speeches by people at the Fed, where they were talking about, hey, if we're going to do quantitative easing, shouldn't we have something kind of rule based? That's so much at the heart of modern macro. It's the it's the little bit of public choice that got imported into modern macro. Um, uh, it solves a lot of problems when people can build expectations about the future, when the Fed is kind of tying its own hands, if, if only by uh, stating some public goals. The Taylor rule was a good kind of rule for that reason. You could tell, we could tell in the mid-2000s when the Fed was way off, when we were, as Taylor says, getting off track. This this new rule might, you know, we can see Narayana Kachalakota um, throwing out a, different, a slightly different rule, a slightly more aggressive rule, actually. So we'll, we'll see some of these rules for how QE could work in the context of price stability debated. And some of them are going to be wrong. So given that QE2 um, doesn't seem to have injected much liquidity into the economy, it injected a lot of liquidity into the bank's balance sheet, mm-hmm. why is this going to be any different? I mean, they're going to buy up a bunch of mortgages that are sitting in on the balance sheets of banks, I assume, mm-hmm. right? So banks are going to have larger excess reserves. They're going to collect their interest. Why is this going to make any difference? You know, this is actually an old question in, in, in macro and monetary economics. Why does any open market operation do anything? Because these are all voluntary exchanges, right? Every yeah. time the central bank is going out there doing a $2 billion open market operation, it's a voluntary trade of one government asset called treasury bills for another government asset called Federal Reserve um, deposits. So these are just – it's swapping assets around, right? So that is a little bit of a puzzle, I have to admit. The usual story is that some assets are more liquid than others and that liquid assets seem to be especially important in money creation. So I, I, I'm – my reading of the data is that um, there have been a you know, number of studies on this looking at uh, how QE2 and QE1 have affected different um, inflation expectations. I think at least on the inflation expectation side. Um, you know, before the time of, of QE2, there was a more substantial risk of deflation. And then QE2 kind of erased that. I think if you just go back and look at, if you just do a Google search, a Google word search, you'll see a lot more references to deflation before QE2 than, than afterwards. I think that, that risk was erased or substantially reduced. Why do you think the Fed is targeting mortgage, mortgage backed securities? And what's the implication for? The Fed, Central Bank of the United States holding most of the mortgages that exist in our economy. It's kind of a weird, flaky thing, isn't it? It's it, it definitely is. It's a strange part of the market for them to be involved in. My guess is that there's a public choice issue going on inside the Fed where maybe that's the most he could get out of these folks. It's possible that that's his first choice. You know, he's you know looking at sort of um, Roger Farmer. Is it uh, Ed Lemer? Ed Lemer or Roger Farmer who does who wrote that housing is the business cycle? That was Lemer. Lemer. So Lemur, um, you know, and other economists note that you know housing is a big predictor of recession and recovery. Um, so part of it could be that this sort of basically very hydraulic macro view: which part went down? Let's try to push that part back up. I have my doubts about whether how important that is. My, trying to read their mind, you know, taking in mind that I don't know, I don't know these folks. I don't, I don't get to go drinking with them. 
Um, I don't think they do a lot of drinking. Because <laughs> they, they, they have to take away the punch bowl. They put it back. They leave the punch bowl kind of in a sacrosanct kind of area of the Fed. They just kind of leave it there. And they don't, they don't dabble in their own sampling, I don't think. But my guess is that um, Bernanke only wanted to do this if he could get a supermajority vote. So he found what he could get a supermajority vote for. Yeah. The supermajority vote gives credible, com- credible commitment to this. So regardless of who's president next year, if, if this thing gets through, this thing got through with a uh, near unanimous vote. So even if a few votes get swapped out, you'll still have a majority. Um, credibility in monetary policy is probably worth making some sacrifices for. Um, building, the, having a Fed that can, that can make and keep commitments is, is such a good thing to have that it's probably worth getting somewhat worse policy in order to achieve that. And that's, you're referring to the supermajority, meaning more than just a bare. Yes. Majority vote. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, there, there are many things in, in, in democracies, right? It's things that's, that just uh, skim through with a slim majority can get overturned next year, right? Yeah. Whereas things that have a super majority, you're pretty sure it's going to be around for a while. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Congress is, I think, I don't, it's a very, um, a lot of tension in the air because there's an election looming. So maybe there'll be more post-election discussion of how to deal with this uh, new era for the Fed as um, as savior. I, I find it uh, I find it a little scary myself, but um, maybe it'll turn out well. It's a it's a high risk time, certainly one way or yeah. the other. Uh, now we focused the whole time on monetary policy. We have a few minutes left. Uh, you're president of the United States. Say uh, you're sympathetic to this risk. You like this policy. Is would you do anything else uh, besides uh, let the Fed be more aggressive? Do you have some other plans? You have some fiscal policy or other things you'd think would be a good idea? I would, I would love to see the United States tackle its long-term entitlement crisis in, in some way that makes it clear to people that the federal government is not on the hook for everybody's health care forever. Um, this is, these incredibly open-ended commitments really have to be, um, they're going to get curtailed one way or the other. I'm certainly, I'm in the camp of thinking that the, you know, the U.S. government is not going to default either explicitly or through inflation. Um, but sooner rather than later would be really nice. Um, Why do you say that other than it seems like the mature thing to do? Um, because, well, for one reason, one reason that the U.S. government is unlikely to default is because it will want to borrow no matter what. Even if we, even if we default on our debt five or ten years from now, it's kind of too early to default. <laughs> Right, because we still have all these baby boomers to fund, and we'll need to repay. Um, there'd be a strong democratic pressure to pay those folks. So countries that de- countries that default on their debts tend to default only slightly. Right, they don't default, you know, a hundred cents on the dollar. And a big part of the reason is because they love having access to um, the financial market. So the the incentive to default is kind of weak. And, but why do you think it's important that we solve this looming crisis? Say. So I'm, I'm in your camp. I'd like to see, I call it grown up behavior, adult behavior. I don't think it's adult or grown up to make promises that you don't have any idea how you're going to keep. Mm-hmm. Not that we all haven't done that occasionally, but it's not adult. It's what kids do. Yep. Um, why is it important that we solve, that we act like grown ups as whether well, the government acts, the politicians act like grown ups with respect to this, uh, the promises that have been made? Well, if we can, I don't want, I don't want a country where uh, the best and the brightest people are doing one of two things, either trying to lobby Washington to get Medicare to use their healthcare equipment or alternately trying to become medical doctors because of the ever-expanding government-subsidized healthcare field. So you know, we may be moving toward a world where the government is basically one massive healthcare provider, and that can sap a lot of our human capital, both on the lobbying side, as people try to come to D.C. for favors. I've seen parts of that in some of my work on Capitol Hill. And um, on the other side, just a lot of people moving into the government-subsidized industry of healthcare. I'm, that's an interesting point, which I'm, I'm sympathetic to. I, I thought you'd say something about the uncertainty created about the fiscal environment when we're not sure how that promise is going to be kept, whether we're going to raise taxes, lower benefits, and that that has implications for economic decision-making. you think there's any relevance there? I think in the short run, this is certainly an issue. Yeah, I think these uh, these one year these one year uh, fiscal fiscal fixes are appalling. 
Um, and I don't just mean that because it's, it's, it's fun to complain about it, but I think it really does uh, hurt the government sector's planning, makes that inefficient, and it hurts the private sector's planning, makes that inefficient. Um, this is this is both whether you're a Keynesian or a supply sider, you should be appalled by this, right? So, and it's only a, it's only the politicians who need re-election of both parties who really don't want to um, just take a hit and sign something that lasts for five, ten, fifteen years. Yeah, more fun to kick the can down the road. Yes, somebody else can do this. So, you know, maybe this will be the time. Maybe this lame duck will be the time when they cut a deal. So, um, there are rumors abounding, but maybe the reason the rumors are coming out is because people want they're they're stage managing their positions, right? I want people to think that I'm the one acting like a grown up. Yeah. My guest today has been Garrett Jones. Garrett, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Uh, always a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.